Hello and welcome to News Clicks International Roundup. In this episode, we're going to discuss the tanker wars that are going on between, uh, between Iran and Britain. And to do this, we are joined by Prabir Purkayasa. So, Prabir, beginning with last week's uh, incident, when the British Royal Marines seized the oil tanker Grace One, which was carrying Iranian oil to Syria near Gibraltar, which is a British overseas territory. And they said that the reason is that this oil being transported to Syria violates sanctions, EU sanctions on Syria. Now, there are no, there is no oil embargo on Syria as such, according to EU sanctions. And also, Iran is not an EU member state. So can you comment on the legality of this action? Well, two things first. There is no evidence, as, we, as of now, to show that it was carrying oil to Syria. So even that is something which is under question. The second part of it is what was the oil. It appears to be crude oil. It appears that it is a, it's a super tanker. It's not even a normal tanker. It's a super tanker, which means the amount of oil it carries is much larger. And it does appear that if the uh, arguments that are being given regarding its destination being Syria, specifically the Banias refinery, and therefore the Banias port, if that's to be taken to be correct, it's difficult to see how this super tanker could have unloaded its fuel there or its uh, crude oil there because the draft that is there in the port does not accommodate the size of a super tanker. Mm -hmm. And that's also one of the reasons it had to go around the uh, Cape of Good Hope because essentially it could not go through Suez Canal. Even if you take for granted that Iranian oil uh, going to Suez Canal could have, had, could have been seized uh, by Egypt under you know, directions by the United States. Mm. So even if we don't take that account, it really had to go around the Cape of Good Hope because of its sheer size. The question that, it, uh, that also needs to be raised is that Grace One is largely used for what are called offshore transfers. Therefore, they really are transferred from ship to ship. Mm. So they are not transferred from ship to port. That doesn't seem to be the way this tanker is used. This is all the information that is available in public domain. The second point, which is also interesting, that for the Indian side, at least, there is an interest that the uh, captain of the ship was an Indian. Mm -hmm. And I saw, I believe, is the first officer. Yeah. So they have been specifically charged with violating sanctions, or specifically, as you said, EU sanctions. Now, third point, I think it's also important to register this, that this seizure of a tanker in Gibraltar, does the Gibraltar laws really uh, have this in its, uh, in its uh, statutes? And it does seem that 3rd July, the laws were changed or mm. modified to allow for such a seizure. Before that, it didn't seem to be there. So it does seem that uh, the UK had prepared in advance that it will seize Grace One. Now, you know, you know, UK has been opposing the uh, say, American sanctions. Yeah. So why would it want to get involved in this is at the moment not clear, unless we see the US state agencies, as Ambassador Bhandra said here a couple of days back, actually are working with the American state intelligence agencies and not the UK government. That could be a charitable interpretation. The other interpretation could be that the UK is clearly choosing sides while playing lip service mm -hmm. to the uh, JCPOA agreement and the fact that the United States has withdrawn from it, not being correct, and the EU should try to see how the agreement can be salvaged. Coming to the question that you raised, the EU sanctions. The EU sanctions, if we go through it, and various people have commented on that, it seems Ex Syrian exports of oil are sanctioned, but not imports of oil to Syria. They have not been sanctioned, uh, assuming that this Iran was really transferring oil to Syria. The second point that comes up that the Banias refinery is under sanctions, but again, the sanction seems to be to, with respect to what would be called uh, equipment or other kinds of supplies, they do not seem to be directed as specifically or explicitly stated as oil or crude oil. That does not seem to be explicitly stated. What is now being drawn as a conclusion 
is an extension of, shall we say, English language, where it has said other resources. So though oil is not explicitly sanctioned, other resources could be financial resources, or it could be considered that oil is a resource and therefore oil could be sanctioned. But sanction language is not an explicit uh, language like this. Sanctions norm is normally ex explicitly mentions what is being sanctioned. So in all of this counts, the sanctions regime, which the United, uh, the, the, uh, the United Kingdom is uh, trying to take as its basis, does not seem to sustain what it has done. But it does seem that this is the first time that a EU member has to really extended the EU sanctions out to outside the EU boundaries, what would be called to extra territorial sanctions, because a ship even calling in the harbor or an aircraft passing through an airport, say in Europe, does its cargo come under the Euro European Union laws? Does it come under the laws of the company shipping the cargo and the company receive, receiving it? These are very open questions in international law. And the weight of international law as of now, the way I understand it is, that it really is extraterritorial to seize cargoes, which are not under both sides, which uh, are not banned, mm -hmm. and which could be under sanctions of a country through which it is transiting. So it does seem that it has a number of legal issues. But as we know, international courts are not particularly, uh, shall we, sensitive to Iran's needs. And therefore, it could be, even if it's a case of piracy or extra legal, uh, shall we say, acti action that the United Kingdom has taken, it could still be years before this, uh, this issue is uh, legally resolved. And moving on to the, the more recent incident where uh, Britain and US have claimed that British commercial vessel was attempted uh, to be captured by Iran. Now again, there is some confusion of the narrative here as well because there are different statements being given by everyone. Britain is saying that there were three Iranian boats that attempted to uh, in, uh, impede the path of their commercial vessel, British heritage, while US is saying that there were five Iranian boats that tried to capture it. And Iran, Iran is saying that there was no confrontation whatsoever. And another thing to be noted is that this uh, vessel turned off its AIS signal, which is the automatic uh, identification system signal, for 24 hours while it was in water. So there is a lot of confusion about what happened. So can you tell us more about that? Well, the AI signal first. It was switched off when it was passing through the Straits of Hormuz. Mm -hmm. And as you know, that is the most narrow part of this whole path. So why would it? turn off its signal in what would be presumably the most crowded part of the sea through which a number of vessels are passing. I think there is a three kilometer passageway mm -hmm. which is considered as transit uh, waters, though it still falls under the territorial waters of on one side of uh, Iran and the other side I think is Oman. So if you look at that, this seems to be very strange. Why a vessel uh, would turn off its uh, uh, AIS signal, particularly because this is what other vessels use to avoid uh, collision. Mm -hmm. So why would that do this is a question that we haven't received any satisfactory answer. Uh, I think there is enough independent evidence, not just Iranians, to say that the AIS signal was turned off. And this is very mysterious. If you remember, the drone uh, which was brought down over Iranian uh, waters, and it does seem it was Iranian waters, and also turned off its uh, automatic signaling system. And therefore, it was also not generating any signal at that part of uh, the trajectory where it was entering Iranian waters. So these are all, uh, what shall we say, provocative measures which invite certain actions. And it does seem, therefore, the Iranian argument that they never really did anything but if they have a strange ship without a signal traversing that water, they would probably be interested in knowing what it is. Mm -hmm. And they would be tracking using their ra radar and other uh, on-sea uh, shore devices. And therefore, they would have an interest in it. So it's quite possible they did follow the ship or they did approach the ship. But that would have been understandable given this history. Mm -hmm. The second part of it is there was a the British warship just following it. 
Now, why should a British airship, be a, water, a British uh, war vessel, yeah. be following this ship is also not very clear. So, there is evidence to show that this is not, shall we say, usual behavior. And this tanker, which was, uh, which is the vessel in question, that tanker was also empty. Mm. So, was this an attempt uh, for the British to entice the Iranians to retaliate against the tanker Caesar and create in Gibraltar? And because the Iranians have said that they will retaliate against the British and they could seize a tanker, was that an attempt to entice them into a, a seizing of their ship? Just is just it was just an accident in which all this happened. Was the British only trying to provoke the Iranians, but not more than that? We do not know. But as I said, in this whole scenario, we have three versions, as you said. The American version, which said they were trying to seize the ship. The British version, which was saying they're trying to impede the ship. And the Iranian version, which said they did none of the two. Okay, so in this, it does appear that the Iranian version is not really uh, very surprising and it does seem to be the more uh, natural uh, of the, you know, natural understanding of the event. And in any case, if there was an attempt to impede or capture the ship, there'd be more visual evidence, mm -hmm. both from the cameras of the, both the uh, naval uh, warship Montrose, I think, which was the, what the British were, were using, and also of the tanker, presumably. So none of this has been given, nor has been any, shall we say, uh, satellite imagery been provided. As you know, these are the most scanned areas in the world today, and obviously there are spy satellites. The spy satellites today give you a resolution of one meter, okay? And even commercial satellite imagery is of one meter. So I fail to understand that if such a serious incident has happened, why it, it would not have more supporting evidence. And it's also very strange. Whenever we have evidence which is required to show that either Russians or Iranians are guilty, we get very fuzzy, uh, poor imagery. When it comes to, say, looking at Russian aircraft in Syria, looking at other things, you get crystal clear images, okay? So this imagery, which is rather partial uh, to certain kinds of views and resolution, when it is general, but the minute it comes to a specific image, then it suddenly becomes very hazy, is also very, very mysterious to all of us. Uh, so Prabhi, finally, why do you think all of this is happening? And do you think that now, considering all of these circumstances and events, there is a possibility of a serious tanker war happening as we have seen in the past between Iran and Iraq? Well, that is the big threat handing, you know, hanging over the world. We have discussed this enough number of times that if it really becomes, shall we say, shooting war or a reputation of the tanker war, then there is a, a, there is a possibility that Iran may be able to stop all oil shipments in the Straits of Hormuz. It's also clear that they are not going to be willingly submit themselves to strangulation, which is what the US is doing. So their answer could very well be the marine shipping that is taking place through that, through Persian Gulf and the Straits of uh, Hormuz. So I think that's a real possibility. You know, the bigger problem that I have is how a warlike scenario can develop, not as a part of a thought out policy, but as a simple accident. You know, the First World War started as a simple accident. Both sides did not want war at that point. So what was a simple assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand in that case finally led to a First World War. So these kind of calibrated, shall we say, provocations as the United Kingdom has done on these two occasions appear, certainly in the case of Grace uh, 1, the tanker, which it seized in Gibraltar. All of this is potential to rapidly spin out of control. So my fear is not that it will start by intent, but it may start by accident, simply misreading what one side is doing and responding in a way that then automatically triggers a much larger conflagration. I think that is the real threat in the region. And this is not only with respect to tankers, it is also with respect to drones, overflight, aircraft, 
and other uh, provocations that may take place. So I think that is the much more serious, uh, shall we say, uh, consideration that we have to give. And there are other players in this who are, could also actually turn rogue or already are rogue in, in this sense. It could be any of the Arab states like United Arab Emirates or Saudis who may decide to provoke Iran to war by doing an action in which Iran has to respond in a particular way. It could be Houthis who are actually at war against the Saudis because Saudis have attacked Yemen and are trying to crush uh, the Houthis over there. They have arms. They have old arms and they have new arms. And they are capable of also launching attacks on ships in the, in the Persian Gulf. So I think uh, also attacking Saudi assets inside uh, Saudi Arabia, as they have done a number of uh, times. It's possible that Iranian answer, asymmetrical war, if what, that's what Iran wants to do, is to supply them with better weapons. They have the ability and the will to go to war against Saudi Arabia anyway, because they are at war. Yeah. So I think all of this is the bigger threat. And unfortunately, the United States policies and the fact that the European Union and the rest of the world is not intervening, that this, these are violations of international law and the United States embargoes on Iran are illegal and we have to respond by saying, yes, these are illegal, we will not accept US sanctions. And countries like India, China also have a role because they are the largest consumer of Iran oil. And there's a huge uh, impact economically that will come on them if they accept Iran sanctions, which they have done. Hmm. They have, India has now stopped buying oil from Iran after May. Yeah. These are huge issues that the world has to address. And it is not just simply a matter of, you know, UK, versus Iran, US versus Iran, but this is a global issue and that is the biggest fear we have. So thanks Prabir for joining us today and thank you for watching News Click.